Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the White Knuckle Podcast, powered by Ozonix. Undetectable, undeniable. Pay close attention to the next five minutes. Well, hey, everybody, we're back with the White Knuckle Podcast, and today we are doing our Ozonix files, real people, real deer, and real results. And I'm joined today with a fellow from Wisconsin by the name of Jason Gibbons. Jason, tell us a little bit about yourself and what it is that you do on a daily basis and uh, what it is that you do with respect to deer hunting. Hey, Jason, thanks for having me. I am a dog trainer in South Central Wisconsin. I train dogs for field work, and we do this on my property, which is 119 acres, and that 119 acres is split by a road even. So it's a, it's a couple of smaller parcels. And um, we are out and active and um, using the property a lot every day. Um, despite that, we focus also on finding deer and um, getting deer onto the property and managing the property for deer hunting. So it would be fair to say that you're around the place an awful lot. Without a doubt. You're enjoying your land to its fullest extent. I'm enjoying the land. I think it's fair to say that um, I spend more time on my land than most people do um, because of my job, which I'm fortunate to have. So you mentioned the fact that you're a dog trainer. I think it'd also be fair to say that you have a pretty good uh, idea of uh, what scent is and and how important a role it is to uh, your dogs, first of all, and and certainly a white-tailed deer. Without a doubt, and I think probably along those lines, I've learned in the last few years that I don't know what scent is um, nearly as well as the animals do. Um, and it's become a focus to try to understand it better and to try to understand wind currents and as they're affected by terrain and trees and hills and grasses. And um, it's really become more and more important with my job with the dogs and with um, deer hunting as I've gotten older. Certainly. The more we, uh, the more we understand, the more it complicates things, right? No doubt about it. Tell us, uh, tell us a little bit about your experience with Ozonix um, and uh, what, uh, what kind of encounters you've had with deer and then ultimately what your results were. You know, the, um, it's a great question. I, I've been using Ozonix for three years now. And um, I, I, I saw it on TV. I saw people using them. And I thought, you know what, I, I just need to try that. Um, I grew up hunting deer by walking out in the woods and blue jeans on and smelling like cigarette smoke when I was a kid and not thinking it mattered. And as I got older and older, um, I realized that everything matters. And Ozonix seemed like a natural path to take. And um, I, I really had some learning moments about scent using the Ozonix. Um, One of my favorite stories, which um, resulted in failure, but was really when I became a believer in Ozonix, involved a hunt at a friend's farm in Illinois. And it was a late season hunt, and it was cold, and it was breezy, and I was set up on the downwind side of a draw, and I had a doe and a couple of fawns come in and spend an hour plus downwind of me within 15 yards of me. And they just didn't know I was there. And it was amazing to me that they could be that close to me for that long and not know I was there. The bad part of the story came when um, I had not changed the battery when I needed to change it after a long, long sit in cold weather. And um, towards the end of the day, the deer started snorting and huffing and eventually left while I was watching the buck that I wanted to shoot on the other side of the draw. He spooked because of them, went the other way. I sat there wondering what had happened. And um, as I cleaned up to go, I realized that the battery in the unit had gone. When the battery in the unit had run out, which was my fault for not changing it because I had a fresh one in my pocket, um, the deer smelled me and left. And I thought, well, 
holy moly, the unit really, really worked. It did exactly what it was supposed to do. I just didn't hold my end of the bargain up by allowing it to keep working. Um, in another story, um, we on the same farm in Illinois, we have a finger that protrudes out into a into a field. I have tried to hunt that finger. I had tried to hunt that finger for multiple years, and we were not able to because of the wind. This last year, I used an Ozonix unit. I actually used two Ozonix units um, with my stand at the tip of that finger in a larger cottonwood tree. Um, I, I, I was amazed by how well it worked. I was amazed by how variable the wind was when I got to sit there and I had deer all around me. Um, left, right, north, south, east, west, I had deer around me. And nobody smelled me. Our target buck on that property came in, and despite the wind being completely wrong, not only did he come in, he came in and was right underneath the tree stand, um, was right next to me. And unfortunately, he was so close, and um, he caught me drawing because he was too close. And and I drew when I had to draw, and it just didn't work out. But again. We're excited about this farm for the future because we feel that that's our best stand on the farm and we can actually hunt it now, whereas we never used to be able to do that. And that's because of the Ozonix units covering us. Um, one of the things that we've learned to do here on this farm is um, enclosed box blinds to help control scent. Now, that does certainly help control scent it keeps your scent in but um especially later in the season um it doesn't keep all the scent in and one of the things that we've started to do is purposely crack windows to allow the scent to drift out and then we've put the um an ozonix unit on the outside of the blind um raining the ozone down over the cracked window um and sort of cleaning that the scent that comes out of the blind um, um, so that we can use those blinds even in poor wind conditions. We've had a ton of success with that. We've had a ton of success shooting big old does later in the season in questionable winds when we were using that. Um, last year, I shot... The biggest buck that I've shot, um, a 163-inch deer, doing the same thing during the rut with a um, with a unit on the outside of the blind um, and a you know light variable wind, so the unit covering me. And um, it's really been it, it's really been helpful as we've learned really how to use these units. So it's been a game changer. It, it absolutely has been a game changer. In yep. an a area that's, uh, it sounds like there's probably plenty of pressure on there so the deer get uh, plenty of education. Um, you know, doing exactly what you said uh, is exactly what the folks over at Ex Ozonics, if you called uh, their technical support line and asked uh, uh, either of the guys that answer the phone there, uh, you know, what what should I do if I'm using it in the blind? What you described is exactly what they would tell you to do. Uh, make sure you're exhausting your scent out that backside where the where the essentially it's gonna the scent's gonna be coming out, and then you're you're eliminating the scent uh, as it comes out, and that's exactly what uh, it sounds like happened in your case. Well, there you have it. Our first Ozonix file in the books. Thanks much, Jason, for sharing your story with us. If any of you have a story you'd like to share with us regarding Ozonix, please reach out to us at www.whitenuckleproductions.com and go to the Contact Us form and let us know your story and we'll give you a call. So as many of you may remember, I announced the first part of June that we were going to be partnering with Ozonix in the White Knuckle podcast, and that would entitle you to a significant prize package. Well, today is your day. Here is the dealio. The kind folks at Ozonix have been so kind and generous, they are going to give away this week on the White Knuckle podcast a HR 300 
and a dry wash bag. An HR300 and a dry wash bag, that's one prize package to one winner. All you have to do is three simple things. Number one, go to either Facebook or Instagram. If you're on Facebook, go to the Ozonics hunting page and make a post on their page and use the phrase, WKP sent me for some gear. If you're an Instagram user, just go to your Instagram page and tag Ozonics in a post about WKP sending you for your gear. Number two, go to the White Knuckle webpage. That's www.whitenuckleproductions.com. Go to the contact tab. Under the contact tab, you'll find an online form submission. Fill out that form and say in the comments, send me my Ozonics. And the last thing is to give us a review on iTunes. No, I'm just kidding. You don't have to do that, but it would be nice if you did. Okay, pretty simple, right? That's all you've got to do is do those two things and you will be entered into the drawing. And a week from the Monday that this show is released, we will announce the winner and Ozonix will send you your free gear. If you do feel so inclined, make sure and say thank you to Ozonix for giving you this opportunity. We certainly are grateful to Ozonix for partnering with us in this endeavor. With that, let's get on with the show. Let's uh, finish up episode number four of four on public land as we do a roundtable discussion about what the guys found. Uh, I have my filming partner, Dave, come in uh, and we get to ask a few questions as we're going to embark upon this whole public land uh, journey this fall. So uh, I hope you enjoyed everything that we've done so far. I hope you enjoyed this episode and uh, we'd love to hear your comments. And again, uh, if you've got something, just uh, shoot us a note on Facebook or our webpage, or uh, you can do it in a review, whether it's one or five stars, we appreciate every review that we can get with that. Let's, uh, let's kick off the show and uh, see if we can't learn a thing or two about public land hunting. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the White Knuckle Podcast. Today, we are here to finish up our series on public land hunting. I've got uh, with me here in Wisconsin, David Prochno sitting next to me. And uh, guys, why don't you just say hello and introduce yourself? Go ahead, hey, man. Not, Go ahead, not, not, not all at once, okay? <laughs> hey, man, this is Todd. It's Curtis here. What's up? What up from North Dakota? It's Luke Psycho. <laughs> that sounded rehearsed, man. <laughs> How's everybody doing? Super. Good. Pretty good. Well, I'm beat, and we had our white knuckle video school yesterday. So Jason and Dave and myself are probably uh, a little bit uh, wiped out yet from a full long day that felt like two days. No excuses, fellas. <laughs> don't worry we'll we'll bring our a game um well let's get let's get things started off um i'll i'll, I'll start with uh lucas um y- you've had a chance to listen to all of the shows uh what was there anything that surprised you well you know what uh when i first listened to curtis's he brought up the topo mat and did I don't even remember. Did you send me a topo map? I did. Jason, I don't remember. I did. Oh, you did? Well, maybe I did. Well, there you go. I still have. That some... shows how. That shows how much I pay attention, probably. Yeah, I think. But I did. Uh, <laughs> that, that was one thing. <laughs> that, that was definitely one thing that uh, I was like, yeah, yeah, topo map would have been great just to just to check in on a couple spots that I was looking at to see if they they would uh, lay out flat like I thought they might in certain areas, but but. Uh, and actually, one of the spots I was just looking at, it looked like, uh, Jason, you know that spot we were talking about where the river pinched down there? It, uh, it, does, it, does, it does flatten out a little bit. It's not quite as steep there. Not as one of those spots. But, but, uh, yeah, I was, no, I was Todd, looking at that, too. What's that? I, was, I, just, I was just heard your podcast. I just listened to it beforehand earlier today, and I was, I was just looking at that. I think when I... When, uh, I was talking about that spot. I like that spot too, but I like mm-hmm. the the hilly part, not right next to the river. Um, mm. Like on the backside oh. of those ridges, if there was like a north wind, they're probably better on the the south end of those ridges, you know. But um, yeah, after after you saying that, it definitely looks pretty good down in there. Right. Right. Yep. And that's when I that's what I was saying was uh. So when I listened to yours and I was looking at it and I, I, I knew exactly what you were just talking about there. And I thought that sounded like is a, 
a pretty good explanation of, of uh, maybe why there'd be something there. What do you think, Todd? Did you catch that? I actually, like, I'm more of an on-the-ground type. I'd have to get get my feet yeah. on the earth there and walk it. Because I, I used to do a lot of, when I lived in Michigan, man, and especially when you're hunting out of state, and I think that's where maps become a huge factor because you got to do something you know, to prepare for the hunt, even if you can't be walking it or whatever. So you shoot your bow and you study a lot of maps, but I've, um, you know, I'm just more of a, 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 on the ground. I look at topos and aerials. I'm, I'm more of an aerial photograph, uh, guy down here in the, in the farmland areas and stuff. But I like just instantly when I looked at that piece of property, it brought me back to all the pieces we used to hunt in Illinois and they always have everything really, really well laid out. Um, which is also a, a bad thing to a certain degree right. because dude they're easy to access everywhere they got beautiful parking areas that look like parks um so that kind of i, I told you I curtis like, there oh. were beautiful parking areas <laughs> nice and manicured <laughs> they're, they're very nicely manicured yeah i mean it's it's uh that's the way they used to be now i don't know I can't imagine the public land hunting in Illinois has like gotten dramatically better in recent years. I always struggled in Illinois. I, I remember years, Curtis, you were saying something that you have hunted in Illinois before. Where, what public lands have you hunted on? And if you're currently hunting, you don't have to say the names or anything, but do you do a lot of hunting in Illinois at all? No, it was actually Indiana. I was talking about Illinois. I've, I've never been to Illinois because they have ridiculous tag prices, man. It's like $500 for a tag. Yeah, I, I definitely think there's why, better. Why would, I, why would I go to Illinois and spend five hundred dollars for a tag when I can go to Missouri for two twenty five or Indiana for one hundred eighty or Ohio for one hundred eighty? You know. Yeah, that's true. Well, I know there's a lot of Illinois residents that hunt at the public places because we met a bunch of them when we were there, you know, years and years ago. But when we used to hunt down in those areas, we were most of the time hunting on private ground, and we use the public land as just backup. Uh, so we never, I mean, that's why I, I never proclaimed to be a, a, a public land expert. I would have probably went and talked to all the, the local farmers right there and phone a piece of private instead of hunting the, uh, <laughs> right. the public land, man. Yeah. Because um, you're smart, Todd. You're smart like that. <laughs> the rest of us are too retarded. We just go and <laughs> run around in the brush with everybody else. <laughs> you guys have nice camps, though, I bet. Oh, <laughs> oh they're the best. <laughs> yeah, we have a great time. Um, and dude, yeah. I think psycho years where you guys hunt, it's like a different world compared to like Illinois. Everything's pretty small. And I think out in your neck of the woods, from what I gathered and just being out in that area of the world before, I mean, it's big country. So it's not like everybody's jacking yeah. one little spot. Or I mean, I'm sure if you find a hot spot and people find out about it and find out psychos hunting there, you probably have more people each year. But I guess the one question mm -hmm. I have for you is in regard to like, your neck of the woods, you guys have a lot of oil business, and I know that's brought a ton of people up into that area of the world for business. Um, are a lot of those guys now hunting, or uh, is it pretty much just seasonal work kind of workers? Oh, no. It's, yeah. It's like, like, uh, like Curtis um, texted me earlier, everybody, uh, everybody uh, with uh, Rico and his dog, you know, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's everybody, man. It's, well, and then the one thing that, that that the oil field has done is it's made all these new roads all over so it's just like having parking spots like the, you know every time there's an oil field location plopped up in the middle of you know some hunting ground well people they don't know nobody says anything they just drive in there and pull off to the side of the road and go out hunting you know there's public land there and so it's just it, it's created a lot more access access points that would be like my biggest complaint you know okay. so and that, and yeah, the numbers have increased just ridiculously. And, and, uh, I mean, just bow hunters in general is, is, is been up. I mean, it's, it's, it's crowded down here now, but, uh, using the river, a guy can still get, get out of there, you know, and find some good spots, but, but yeah, it's way different from Illinois. And Hey, I've killed an Illinois deer. It was on private <laughs> land. That's right. That's uh, right. You have. I was down in, yeah, that was down with, uh, Keith Graham and them. And, and, uh, and, uh, that was, uh, back in '09, I believe. Yep. Was that on a yeah, WKC was... video or what? What's that? Was that on a white knuckle DVD or no? I think I think we that was the first year. I, actually, yeah. I think that yeah, was yeah. the first year I did kill uh, for white knuckle. There, we we just attached that one to it just to just to yeah just to get get people to know me. I think a little bit better was, it yeah, was just, I, think... I had like three kills there. Keith, yeah, I'll have Keith... to re that one. <clears throat> I... 
I remember yeah, Keith Graham telling me. Yeah, it was, it was actually me, really awesome. Uh, I, I told Keith Graham or uh, Keith Graham, uh, Derek and um, and Quinn were on our team, and and Keith was like, he had just had this guy Lucas like on camp that year, and he's like, you got to talk to that kid about filming for you. He has all kinds of cool footage. So I think you brought a bunch of footage down to show him, and you were mm. kind of self filming, mm -hmm. doing your own yep. thing. Yep. What um yeah. what what got you into filming in the first place, Psycho? Uh, well, history class. Uh, history class. We had our, our teacher. David Perky had a had a school camera, and me and my buddy, me and my buddy Justin, thought it would be neat to just take it out and do some some filming. And I had run around with a camera for for years, just filming anything and everything with just my buddies. We were just, I don't know, it was just for some reason we like to be in front of the camera. I like to look at myself. We'll just say, <laughs> but uh, uh, that's kind of how it started. Was we our our, uh, our teacher let us borrow it, uh, and we we took it out bow hunting and. Hell, we first time we took it out, we almost killed a deer, and and then just eat, being able to watch that back and talk about it and laugh about it because you know we were morons, so we just laughed our laughed our butts off at it. So it just right from there. I mean, I love bow hunting, and then I love to use the camera. I love looking back and showing everybody everything. And the more I did it, the more I became, you know, kind of hooked on it. So uh, that was the rest is history there. <laughs> cool, man. Lu awesome. Lucas, did you start hunting um, public land as a result of just the, the the simple fact that there's so much available to you, or did you do it out of necessity? Uh, probably both. Probably both because, uh, and the reason I I actually got into bow hunting was my my old man, my my dad. He uh he was tired of not drawing a rifle tag, and he he was a he was a rifle hunter for his whole life. And, uh, I don't know, he must've been probably about 40 years old or so when, uh, when he first picked up a bow because he was tired of not drawing a rifle tag. And, and he went for a whole year or two years there, I think. And I, I kept hearing all these stories about when he was out and he'd come home and tell me about him. And finally I'm like, Hey man, <laughs> let me go with you. I want to go out and try this. And so I, I just went with him tagging along and, and we had, had some crazy hunts, just me sitting next to him watching. And, and so, uh, so that was part of it. Uh, he 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 kind of was tired of not drawing, so he he just decided we could draw. We could just get a bow tag every year, so we did that. And then yeah, and then there was nobody doing it back then. There was there was rarely anybody else out there, so it was just we had this whole valley to ourselves almost. You know, you almost ran no nobody was out there, so it was. Uh, I miss those days. Those were the days when I'd pick up like a hundred sheds in a season. No, <laughs> now no. lucky. Now, yeah yeah. Now lucky to pick up ten. It's just, it's insane. In an, in an area that was relatively low pressure with respect to public hunting ground, you, you it sounds like you know even with the decline that we hear, uh, even at the ATA show and things of that nature, even with the decline of all the hunters that they say that are out there, you're you're seeing more and more hunters every year. Yeah, yeah, but but bigger deer also. Oddly enough. You know, there's 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 getting to be bigger and bigger deer up here all the time, and but that, that means they're getting they're getting smarter too. I mean, just you know, there's so many people up here that, you know, you can't call to them sometimes. You have to be in a perfect situation to get them to come, and it's it's tough. It's tough, but you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't have it any other way. So Lucas, in in your neck of the woods, there is there much for private land available? Even if you wanted to go knocking on doors, are there doors available? Oh yeah, yeah. And there's a lot of spots that are landlocked, you know, by private private ground. And either you can get onto them if they're right up against the river. The only place to get onto them from somebody that isn't knocking on a door is you just take the boat and you get up there and you come off the riverbank because you can, you know, you can come in from the river if that's public right up against the river. And then, uh, but yeah, there's a there's a lot of private up here yet, yeah. And and there's some really good private hunting. I know I know a lot of a lot of people that just slay monsters year after year after year in the same spots. It's crazy. Okay, so that's a question I would have for you, you know, and for Curtis. So you, you put a lot of energy and time into scouting public ground, um, and this is kind of born out of Todd's uh, podcast from before, where he talked about he reached a point where he just gave up on the public and decided it was it was more beneficial to go knocking on doors and gain access that way. Why not put more time into that instead of, of combing the public? Go ahead, Curtis. You go ahead first. Well, I don't know. I feel like 
you're still pretty limited with the private chunks. I mean, <clears throat> for the most part, it's going to be, it's hard to find private land that's not hunted by at least another guy. But to find, to find a 80 plus, you know, 80 acre plus, even 40 acres, just for your own good, that's actually like in a good location. It's almost, it's hard to find, you know, I mean, if, if, I think your best bet would be to, you know, if you're going to go that route as far as private land hunting goes and asking, knocking on doors and all that, I think your best bet is to just go and be like, hey, like if it's a really good chunk, most of the time you got other people hunting it, mostly during the rut, but it, you might be able to like squeeze in like an early season hunt or something. You know what I mean? Like if you got some big bucks coming out of the field, and you're like, hey, I don't think anyone hunts this early at all. You could go and knock on their door and be like, hey, do you mind if I, you know, hunt there the first week or two or something? And, you know, you might be able to get away with that. But even right now, for the most part, I think um, you're pretty much going to be leasing land around here. I mean, unless you're, hit, you know, sitting on a really tiny little 20-acre chunk or something that's kind of crappy, you're really not going to be in luck knocking on doors at least around here anyways i think it's definitely geographically um geographically controlled because even 10 years ago here in iowa it was a lot different you could get if you went and knocked on 10 doors you get five yeses now you really have to work for it but it's still possible but just because the the number of people and the just the general population is so much lower here and then you i mean you get out to kansas it's even lower yet and some of the other areas i think we all just need to move to northern saskatchewan and forget about it yeah <laughs> i'm game I, I, feel like, <laughs> I, feel, I feel like that's that's how i see it too like i feel like the more east i go from wisconsin the more pressure and then the more west i go it's it gets less and less pressure the farther i go are you speaking about yeah. w- with respect to the state of Wisconsin or just west in the country? I'm talking like so. I was over in like Indiana, which is I'm mean, guess it's south, but east east of Wisconsin, southeast of Wisconsin. And that that was had the most pressure out of like all the public that I've ever been on. Even in Wisconsin, like I found a lot, but you know more spots in Wisconsin with less pressure than Indiana. And I was kind of surprised about that. And then, because uh, Wisconsin's pretty hit, hit pretty hard. But, there, I mean, there's some spots where you can get away from people. And then Missouri is, like, a lot less pressure than and, – and I was in Iowa, southern Iowa, too, kind of south-central Iowa, and there's not too much pressure there either. So, I'm, I mean, I'm kind of just getting the, the feel for, you know, the farther you go west, it, it feels like the more away from people you're going to get. But, I mean, who knows? Like, I mean, that's not necessarily true either. That's just what I've experienced. Guys, if if, Kurt, if I could get you to each answer this question, and it's a, a question that I've uh, I've been wondering and wanted to, uh, wanted to ask ever since we started doing this series, and that was, you know, each of you spoke about people and the, the necessity of getting away from people. Um, with the exception of, of Lucas, a little bit. Now, I'll get back to that in just a minute. But is the primary goal in terms of what you're trying to accomplish from from the start? Obviously, you want to kill a deer, and I get all that. But, I mean, is is your one of your main goals uh, in terms of, of a tactic is to get away from people? Yeah. Um, all right. Well, I think pretty much – I mean, Todd pretty much said it is – and his podcast is like, wherever there's no people, there's going to be deer. It could be in the dumbest spot, and there's going to be probably deer there. If there's no human scent and you're not getting bothered, most likely there's going to be deer there. So, I mean, that's pretty much, I guess, yeah, I mean, pretty much you're just trying to get away from people because that's where the deer are going to be, you know. Um, there, I mean, obviously there is spots, like, there's a spot down in Indiana that I found that I might go down there in a weekend, but there, the deer sign is there. It's getting pounded. I mean, I'm talking like bedding area, like just pounded. And you know that there's some good 
bucks going in there during the rut. But then on the other hand, there's a bunch of human sign too. So you kind of have to, um, in that spot, I'm not really sure how to, you know, go across, go about that as far as, you know, there's a ton of human sign, but there's still a bunch of deer sign too. So I'm, I'm thinking maybe it's only getting hit during gun hunting or, you know, maybe only during like November or so. I mean, I'm thinking like a spot like that might be decent, you know, kind of in the late October range, you know, where you're not going to get as many people, but the deer are still there and still have potential at, you know, killing a good one. But yeah, for the most part, um, I mean, yeah, wherever there's no humans, there's going to be deer, you know? Um, yeah, I, I think the reality of it is no matter where you're from, you, part of hunting is you're going to have to deal with people and I deal with them and it may not be at the scale of like a public land hunting thing, but you know, you got to also learn how to use that to your benefit because other people and other hunters in my neck of the woods that I benefit from and I need to use as part of my strategy each year because, uh, there's a lot of nice deer and a lot of territory. So in certain areas, I have to literally let the pressure move the deer for me. And then I have to be patient before I can move in on them. So it's not just as easy as uh, getting away from the people. It's also using, you know, using what intel they can provide you and what you know of their hunting habits to work for you and benefit you. Because if one thing, if you know a particular area is getting pounded, you know there's not going to be a big deer calling that his core area. So, okay, use that. Now move next to it and keep moving until you're on one. Good point. Right, right. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, Todd. That, that's that's basically all I do up here is, is uh, you're never going to get away from everybody. You, you just won't. There's this day and age, there's too many hunters. You know, there's too many people just out running around in general. And uh, what I've found is if I walk into a piece of timber around here, I, I know one right off right off the back of my, my mind here that, that uh, it's just littered with tree stands. Like, I can't even imagine how many tree stands are actually in there. I've never counted them all, but... If you walked in there, you would just probably say, nope, nope, not happening. I'm not even going to hunt in here. But the, the odd thing is there's, there's, there's so many people that go out and hang tree stands, and they'll just never come back. Or they, or they'll just leave them there. You know? They won't even come back to them. And that's one of those spots that it's just people are just the, – the people sign is everywhere. But come hunting season, you'll run into a couple people here and there. But for the most part, that place is just ridiculous. You can just have big buck encounter after big buck encounter. And then, like Todd said, is is when you do find out where the people are, you just got to know where they're going to be, and you can play off of that. And I've done that a lot of times. You know, there's little little pockets, little pockets. That, usually, the spots that that suck to get to, that people are like, oh, I really don't want to walk clear around this or across this water or do this or that just to get to that spot. But if 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 you can if you can find those little sections, and usually they're really thick and nasty, you know, and you can get get snuggled away back in there somewhere and. That, that's where you'll have just some of the most intense action ever is because those deer get just like bottlenecked down to one certain area sometimes. And, and you just, you don't even know what to do. You have deer moving everywhere. You're almost in a panic there, especially with a, a camera and you're trying to film yourself. You're just like, Oh, I film over here. film over there. Is this a big buck? Is this a, <laughs> it's just crazy. So, but that's right. I agree completely with Todd and Curtis. It's just, it's just about, you know, whether, whether or not you find the people or you don't, but you just got to use it to your advantage when you can. And, you know, and, so somebody's going to go in there and hunt a spot with a bad wind. And if you got a good idea where maybe that deer is bedded and if he's going to blow them out of there, well, he's still going to come out and feed. And a lot of times they will, that he just might bump them out and they're just going to make a circle. And then, you know, you might be able to connect on him that night if you get in there and you just kind of use him, you know, making that mistake to your advantage. So that brings up uh, kind of an example for me too, is, uh, you know, I went into the spot, and um, I was just pulling a camera, and it ended up getting, because I shot one early, this was 2015, and I I had this camera um, kind of close to this bedding area I found, this buck bedding area, and I was just going to pull it when I went in to hunt. So I just went in there to grab it before I started hunting Missouri, and there was a bunch of trails, caught like human trails, and like, you know, a bunch of sign and all that tree stands hung and mineral blocks and corn piles and whatever. And, uh, I went in there and the trail camera was gone. I was like, all right, that sucks. But 
I felt like I, I was just thinking about it and like what you said, once people like move in and everything, you kind of hunt around them. There's a, like across mm-hmm. the marsh from that area, there's another really good bedding area. And I think for the most part, they kind of just bounce back from, you know, different bedding areas, wherever they aren't going to get pressured is where they're going to go. So like if I still had a tag and I was hunting that area, I would have been like, Oh, so all these guys moved in here. They're not going to see anything so dark. If not, you know, if they're not going to see anything. And then I just go hunt that other bedding area that I scouted out in the springtime, you know, across the marsh from that area. They're probably there. Right. Hey, man, man. I do that. I do the same stuff here and I have to hunt on my property. I found that all the money spots, like the perfect spots that had tree stands and the guy that owned it before me had stands there and the guy that owned it before him had stands there. All those spots have educated the deer in my area so much that I can't really even hunt those little kick butt spots where you've got great access and you've got great shots in all directions. It's like everything always ends up being in the weird spot that is either almost impossible to get into or that's been completely overlooked and the deer have just patterned these people year after year. So if you're hunting on public land, obviously you got to play in the fact that those deer have been raised in those areas and the ones that survive like here happen to be the tough, tough deer. You're going to have to work extra hard and sometimes just get plain lucky on. Right. Yeah. Like, you know, when you're looking at a map and stuff and you're picking out these like perfect little funnels and stuff like that, like you said, for the most part, I think, that's kind of not the thing to do when you're trying to kill some bucks because, you know, you're either going to meet up with some other people or, you know, the bigger bucks are probably going to think, yeah, I've, I've gone down this trail before and get shot at. I've learned, you know. Right. Yep. I'm still waiting to find some really stupid bucks to hunt, but I can't. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you know what, uh, Todd, that was one thing too. You said, uh, the, uh, the stupid spots, you know, it's, it's really amazing. It's amazing how these deer figure it out. And it, and it almost isn't because, you know, it's life or death for them. But, but in the rut, especially them deer will bed in the most, uh, the most stupid spots. Like there's a, so in the valley that I live in, it used, it used to be, uh, farmers, you, you know, there's a farmstead all over. And then, uh, and then the core bought them out. Uh, because of the there was there was, there was uh they weren't gonna be able to get flood insurance I think is how it goes I don't know, don't quote it on me but the so the river would flood down here and so I think I think they were gonna stop getting covered by flood insurance and stuff so I think the core ended up buying them out so none of these places are you know having houses there anymore but there's all the tree rows and stuff that where mm-hmm. the houses were that, that they put their tree rows around their houses and there's there's one particular spot where my grandma used to live. I have a little fort. I have a fort that my, my, my brother and my buddies and all of us, we built when we were kids. And it, all there is is framework left on the ground. And there's there's always a big buck bedded in there every every rut. I can drive in there every rut and, and just drive right into the yard and walk right towards the tree row and jump a big buck out of there. So this is the third year in a row I've done that, and now next year I'm just going to try to kill the damn thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> I wish they would do the like, same stuff, I don't know. man, every year. I don't know. I don't know why the hell I haven't tried yet, but uh, this this past year I was just driving through the valley one morning and I was like, I'm gonna drive in the grandma's little place over here and and, and see if there's a, a buck bed in there again. And sure shit, there was Run, running out of there with a doe. You know, there's there's one thing that uh, I, I noticed out of the three separate shows um, that was that was interesting and uniquely different from Todd. So Lucas, your perspective on things versus Todd and Curtis's was was different in one respect and that was you you may have been concerned with people and pressure but you didn't talk about it talk about it quite as much as they did do you think that that's a result of um just your perspective where you come from where you live um or were you just making the assumption that everyone would think that that's just going to be a, you know, a point that's taken for granted, or do you think it's just a result of, again, where, where you live and, and the amount of pressure that's out there? Yeah, I would, I would say 
well, this place doesn't get near the pressure. I'm not going to talk the pressure up like it's something up here compared to the Midwest states because I know it's it's uh, it's far from as as bad as it is down there. But uh, I don't know what is it. Is it Wisconsin or Michigan that have the most per capita hunters? One of those two, right? They're right uh, up I there. think it, I think Michigan and a lot of those states like. In the east, like Maine and all that. Pennsylvania stuff. and stuff like. Yeah, Pennsylvania. Yeah, yeah. Michigan. Yeah. So I mean, Michigan's pretty, pretty bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so I mean, yeah, probably, probably more than anything, and, and and you know, and it's just the one property. So I guess when I was looking at it, it was like, you know, I'm gonna go in there, and if there's if there's people everywhere, I'm just having issues with it. Well, obviously, I ain't gonna bank everything on just that one little spot, anyways. You know, if I'm hunting public land or something. So I'm just going to, you know, either it's going to work or it's not, and I'm just going to move on, you know. So that's kind of how I was looking at it. <clears throat> right. I think I think Lucas has a heck of a lot more land options and acreage to work with um, than parts of the Midwest. But the other part is I think farmland makes a big difference in uh, creating opportunities to kill big deer. You can hunt big woods, but, like, Michigan, a lot of Michigan public land is, like, pretty – pretty bad habitat i mean just a lot of pine trees not a lot of farmland and and they basically live on acorns and um and browse you know and so there's and and i suppose bait you know because that's how some of these states still are but uh, but i there's still some cool things happening like walter easing's had a really good run of luck up in michigan it seems like they're the age class is getting better there's more bigger deer around all the time and it's becoming kind of consistent compared to you when i grew up hunting up there there was just nothing that survived past one year old or two years old so i still think there's pockets where you can find good deer. but i think wisconsin also has some better management a lot of better farmland and and people who are a little bit more on the qdm side of things they still kill a lot of young deer but um compared to Michigan and Pennsylvania and, and places like that, I think there's, I don't know, it's it's a little bit easier to raise bigger deer and hold them possibly too on private land. Uh, do you think, do you think that, do you think that, uh, you know, deer, like even up here, like they're growing a little bigger and you, you keep hearing it, you know, the more podcasts I've listened to, it sounds like nationwide overall deer deer size is getting you know a little bigger you know deer, people are seeing bigger deer in some areas anyways i wonder if that's just a generational thing you know this next generation of hunters you know we're coming in this time when everybody wants that monster 200 inch white tail you know and everyone wants a booner and whatever or 150 you know in some states like here a 150 up here is a big big deer i mean it's yep. you're gonna probably be a six plus deer you know and he's gonna be a big old buck but uh I wonder if it isn't just a generational thing, you know, just people are becoming more, more, uh, you know, paying attention to wanting to kill that bigger deer. So they're letting smaller bucks go now, finally, maybe. I think so. And I know at least in Michigan's cases, there is some antler restrictions going on and things like that. But, you know, I wonder how much Facebook plays into it. Cause you think about True. how, how it's really connected, you know, the entire hunting community where years ago, you know, there was only a couple of websites that were even out there where you could talk hunting crap, you know, on the bow site or hunting that was one of them. And, um, and uh, the Kiski forum, I think we all probably were on the Kiski forum for a period of time or, or longer. And now it's like, you kind of realize there's a lot of trophy hunters out there. And I think that's becoming more of kind of like how fishing the, the middle end dropped out and it became either weekend warriors who, you know, are going to do their week trip a year and that's it. Or the other people just got more and more serious about it. They start bow hunting. When they get older, they get crossbows. Um, and I think there's people are investing more money in hunting these days with land and things like that. So I think inevitably, I think big bucks, QDM, all that stuff has just been played over and over. It's marketing and advertising. The more you see that stuff, uh, it makes an impression on you every time, whether you realize it or not. And I think it's gotten cooler to let a little buck go than to kill it, man. Yeah, I 100% agree with both of you there. So, and I, I think all of us contribute to that and all of us also are, are, are a part of the nightmare. I mean, like we joke around down here too, like about, you know, basically advertising the areas we're hunting and, um, and it goes against a lot of times even talking about some of the stuff go, goes against, um, the, you know, the big buck hunter and all of us like of shutting up and flying under the radar and that kind of stuff. So we're all our own worst enemies at the same time too. Yeah. 
Right. Yeah. So getting getting back to um, the the three separate shows that we did, um, I think all of you relatively had the same thing to say in terms of what it was that you looked for from a fifty thousand foot view. Um, would you guys agree with that, or did you, in listening to everyone else's shows, did you guys have anything you wanted to add to that? No, I was. I, I thought. I thought it was. Yeah, roughly about the you know the same type of look at it. You know, and I think we kind of all are. We can all agree that you know when you first look at something like that, it's all we can really do is speculate. You know, and I mean, I don't know. I don't think either any three of us are expert map readers. I know I'm not. <laughs> like I said, right. I, I look at my Onyx map app on my phone and for the most part like it's 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 flatter ground here so but uh yeah i I think we we kind of kind of had the same same uh same uh uh, take on that was was uh i guess if it's gonna happen it's gonna happen i'm just gonna move on to the next spot you know i mean not gonna put all our marbles on one little public spot so anybody else have anything they want to add to that yeah, I mean, I definitely agree there. I think we all pretty much, you know, came to the conclusion that it was that it was something where it could be good, but you would have to be ground scouted to know that. I think, I think, I mean, it could be put words in someone's mouth, but I think all three of us could probably would probably just kind of bypass that. And you know, there's some maps that you look at and you're like, oh, dude, this is going to be good. You know what I mean? And for the most part, you can pick point. You know, you can look at a map and be like, "Yeah, that spot's probably going to be good." It's two miles away from a parking lot, and it's got you know, there's like a little island and stuff in the cattails or whatever, or you know, whatever kind of feature you're looking at. But I mean, for the most part, you could probably pick out a better map than what was given to us. You know. Yeah, as far as the spot, it's pretty restrictive. It what didn't look like a giant area, and it. I don't know. To me, my gut is I would always go just put foot on the ground, see what kind of deer sign is mm-hmm. in the area. And if it's it's pretty obvious if you walk into areas and you find, you know, shredded ridges where there's huge buck sign. And you can tell it's a year after year after year. The bucks have been re- rubbing in there. You know, sign doesn't lie. Um, and I would probably guess the the most I would expect to see on a piece like that in Illinois is you might you might be able to shoot a, a nice three year old or something and to kill a big mature deer just depends on whether there's one there but it's tougher and tougher to find them in illinois in particular it's been hunted pretty hard uh over the years and there's just a lot of residents in illinois as well so in the way the taxes are people are going to have to eat venison because they won't be able to afford to buy any food (laughs) (laughs) todd let me todd let me ask you who was what was the name of your buddy that um he had the lone wolf assassins and the body harnesses and yeah, um, Cooner, Brad Cooner. Brad. So I was fascinated by him that based on a set of tracks, he would hang there for five days just knowing that that buck was probably going to be by there, even though he'd never seen it before. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. When do you guys decide to pull the plug on a piece? I mean, you've, you've scouted it, you've looked for some sign. How long before you just say, you know what, I'm, I'm out of here, versus hanging there for five days and having faith? Um. It depends on a lot. I'm impatient, oh, yeah. Isaac, man. If I, if I don't see something, like, I mean, I hunted on a lot, lot of crappy ground over the years. Todd, and Todd that's over not time true at all. With... You're, you're, you, 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 <laughs> yeah. you're super Dude, patient. Illinois, what are you talking <laughs> about? <laughs> but I, I, think, I think you're better off being impatient than patient, to be honest with you, if you want to kill a mature deer. you got to be, you got to move right in. And it seems like, and we all know this, guys, over the years, when you go into the right area in the right piece, it's obvious, and you don't have to be a very good hunter to kill that deer. It's just finding that spot can be a pain in the neck sometimes. Right. Yeah. I guess, finding, yeah. I guess the way it... Go ahead, Curse. Yeah, I mean, finding, uh, finding the deer is the hardest part. Like, as far as trail cam, we can shine here in Wisconsin. I, know you, I don't think you can do it in Iowa or North Dakota, but shining is like ridiculous you know like most people are sitting there waiting to check trail cameras and all that stuff i'm like dude i'm gonna be driving around all night long trying to find deer you know oh all man i'm sitting here at night you know not thinking i'm not <laughs> thinking about trail cameras i'm thinking about i'm gonna drive around and find them 
figure out where they are. And get your 100 million time. watt. <laughs> I mean, man, Curtis. That's the hard. Yeah, you guys probably are like, oh, you know, shine's cheating or whatever, probably, but. I mean, <laughs> no, it's, no, like it's I, I envy that part. I envy that part, man. That, that's got to be a killer, killer little tactic, man. Because I mean, I, I know it is. Just, I mean, you're driving down the road. You can't even like swerve your pickup off off the road just a bit and shine a field. You can't do that here. That's you're harassing the animals. So I mean, you'll be driving, you know, out, you know, out of the out of the woods, or you're going into the woods in the morning, and you'll see these deer. I mean, you just know there's like a big buck right there, and you're like, oh man, I just wish. <laughs> so when you're coming to so, so everybody comes to the corners in the road, and all of a sudden they slow way down because <laughs> you, you, you can legally shine the field because you're just slowing down, turning the corner, you let your field, your light shine across the field. I don't do that though. No, not this guy. Nope. Oh, <laughs> uh, it's the number one thing I think oh. it takes to figure out to kill mature deer consistently is you you rely 100% on intel. You have to know where they are and to see it with your own eyes, that is instant. You know where that deer is, and you can plan for your morning hunt, your next evening hunt, where they come into that field. So, Curtis, I, I do the same thing with trail cameras, and because I hunt the same property year after year, and I know from experience where the bucks are going to be better, it's just a matter of finding the buck I'm going after. Um, but I do the same thing with trail cameras, basically, that you do with Shining, but it's all about intel, and you're getting fresh. In, you're getting instant intel that way. Right, right. yeah, I mean, I mean... Yeah, I mean, I, the thing about shining that makes it even better than trail camera. I mean, I use trail cameras too. I mean, I, but it's like you can shine all night long, and you know you have to have that deer walk right in front of that trail camera. You can shine, and you know you can cover a whole field. You know you can cover a yeah. whole area. You know it's just it's it's pretty. I mean, if you haven't shined or anything, that's that's a big that's a big player and like if where i can find the deer that i you know what i mean i don't i don't yep. shoot that guy in big box but i can shine him <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I, I can don't shine with the best of me. well i can tell you guys all this much i absolutely love shine <laughs> <laughs> hey, yeah so my only shining i'll do and then so this is this is this is a, my little secret here um, probably not much of a secret, but I don't ever see anybody else doing it, but I'll wait for full moons when I get a little bit of snow on the ground. If I get a full moon, I can go out in that, that night and just glass with my binoculars and I can, t- I can see big bucks playing today. So Dude, that, that's what I'll do. I'll, I'll just wait until about two, three in the morning when it's way up high, go out for a drive through the valley and see hundreds of deer. And then there it is. I know there's a big deer there. That's the, so I can just mark several spots for late season. I'm going to be focusing on that. I know that there's big deer there and it works out. It works out big time. Natural shining, dude. Yeah. Natural. I'm all natural up here, guys. Come on now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, too cool, man. In, in going down my list of questions that I asked you guys, um, in terms of, of, uh, geographically what whatever what what were the top three things that y- y'all look for um i don't know that there was any huge differences but if you could all pick one and just elaborate on that one more time for those of us who weren't paying attention the first time um if we can start off with uh todd what one of your top three things that if you were going to hunt public ground again um what is it that you would look for uh, I, I think all of us agreed, and, and I found that uh, at least reassuring that I'm, at least I'm not going out of my mind here in Iowa hunting alone. <laughs> um, but uh, that waterways are such a huge factor, and it's not just for drinking, uh, but it's for security, safety, but also access. And that's that's my secret of success is I have more access in this area than any other bow hunter. Period. So I can get extremely creative, and I have to force myself to get creative. But water usually plays a part in it in some way, shape, or form. Not always, but, man, I'll tell you, most of the bucks that I've ever found core locations are, they're very, very close to a running creek. And it's almost, I mean, it's it just, it goes right with whitetails. So I think the, the quicker you realize that, um, it's going to be around water. And what water also has is, a uh, constant source of nutrition for the vegetation in that area. So 
there's always going to be the best browse, the greenest browse near a water source. And it's just once you start kind of realizing that it's a no brainer, that's of course where most of the deer are going to be close to. Okay. Um, Lucas. So what, yeah, what, what, I, I, yeah, Todd, Todd pretty much broke that down perfectly. Um, I'll add one more thing though, is, uh, if I'm going to, if I'm looking for a public piece to hunt, uh, I know, I know Curtis mentioned this in his podcast. Uh, I'm going to look, I'm going to look for the, the most populated cities, you know, in the area. I'm going to find, I'm going to pretty much go on a map and find like the geographical center of where, you know, of all those places and try to get as far away from each one of those spots as you can. And then, uh, then I'm going to start picking that apart and then, uh, try to, try to figure out if there's, if there's some, some hidden little spots out there that maybe one road is going to go within even a mile of it. And, you know, there's, there's not very many spots I know out there except for maybe out in the West here that you're going to be able to, you know, park and walk a mile or two miles, you know, to get out to a spot and be, you know, not right in top, right on top of the next farmer or something, but. Up here, you can do that. Montana, you can do that. Nebraska, uh, I know. I know South Dakota, Wyoming. You know, you can find spots like that. So I would just say, just hey, if you can, if you can get out and, and get into a spot where you can, you can get away from the people, and you can find a water source there, like Todd said, man, you're you're, you're kind of right in the money right there. You, you know, the first first problem is kind of kind of solved there. Give me one more. Um, in other words. Uh of the top three things that you look for one that todd hasn't mentioned what else would you look for oh myself me yeah you yep all right well like i said just location you know i would i would want to i would want to find spots that are, are are away from the cities away from the biggest cities and i'm gonna i'm gonna look for several chunks i mean i'm not gonna really be i could almost care less what it looks like on the ground you know from from looking at a map view if I can just find enough spots in one area that I can go, all right, this is, this can, this will last me a couple of days where I can bounce around in these areas. Cause I'll hunt as aggressive as, as anybody, just because if you're hunting public land, just get in there, get after it, F- figure it out, find the trail, find some waterways, some tracks across it, or, you know, a little water hole that might have some tracks in it. Find some tracks, you know, tracks, like I think Todd said, and tracks never lie, you know? So that's, that's one thing, you know, get your boots on the ground in there, but I'm just going to skim the map quickly and, and find some find some public areas that are out away from the, the larger cities. And I'm just going to get after it on foot. That's that's really about all I would do. Curtis? Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of that was covered. That's all good stuff. Um, one thing I guess I'd like to add is, uh, I mean, it's, I like, you know, it, it, a lot of times say there's no rivers or nothing. And... You know, you have no water. A lot of the hill country spots, you know, where there's bigger hills and stuff, there's just kind of just streams. There's not really, I mean, there's a lot of rivers and stuff too, but I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of public chunks that don't have water that are still good. And I think a lot of that, a lot of that is, um, you know, the, those big bluffy areas where it's like, Dude, you pull on a parking lot, you look up, and you're like, I got to walk all the way up there just to get to the top of the stupid hill, you know? Like, and that's not even where you're going to hunt. And that's the kind of stuff that, I mean, if you're not in, like, somewhat decent shape, you're not even going to be able to get up that hill, you know? But, I mean, that's, so that's going to cut out, you know, some of the, the hunters already. And then, you know... On top of that, you have to go, you know, find out where they're located and stuff, which usually isn't right next to the parking lot. And that's that's going to be a big thing for me. Um, another thing is, like, I'm just going to give uh, Wisconsin for an example. And there, it goes in every other state, too. There's always that specific area where everyone's like, dude, that's where all the big bucks are getting killed. Like Buffalo County, Wisconsin, everyone's like, oh, dude, let's go hunt Buffalo County. Or, you know, I'm sure there's a spot in Iowa, which I don't know of. That's, yeah, Van you know, County, probably. It, yeah, I mean, the spots that are like, that's where most people are going to go. You know, like people are like, I know a lot of people from Wisconsin, that, like people message me and stuff, and they're like, dude, you ever hunt Buffalo County? You ever hunt Buffalo County? And it's like, no, I don't hunt Buffalo County because. <laughs> 
there's like one, there's a couple of public chunks there, you know, some NFL or whatever, but I mean, there's so much ground that's, you know, that's good right next to Buffalo County or, you know, just south of that or, you know, it's not necessarily where all these big bucks are getting shot that, you know, Buffalo County is pretty much all private land with mega management owned by a lot of rich people. That's pretty much Buffalo County summed up. And there's a lot of counties that are just overlooked. And I think that's one thing too, is this, you kind of want to just, you know, try your own stuff and try to figure out your own places to hunt. Don't, necessarily just go off of well that's that's the area you need to be that's where you need to hunt you know figure it out yourself you know what i'm going to do is uh give give dave the floor here to bug each of you guys for a question if if that's okay with you sure um and uh i i knew you guys wouldn't be prepared for it so i thought that would be the most fun so that's why i didn't say anything Um, i haven't been prepared for this whole thing so we're good (laughs) (laughs) you did just fine man um, so I'm going to, I'm going to turn it over to Dave here for a second and, uh, I'm going to get him a water. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm really thirsty guys. Uh, one of the questions I have for somebody that's kind of transitioning from all I've ever really known is, is private land and getting into a more of a public scene. Does it change my gear at all? Is there anything special that, that you guys would recommend for somebody that's going to make that, that leap? Hey guys, all at once. Lone wolf tree stand. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> pretty much. Yeah, just plan on that was the first gun given. Man. That's that's what yep. you really need to. You got to get in that mindset where you're not going to find. It's not. It's going to be a lot of work, but that's also kind of the cool part too. Is you you can always yep. put the pressure on and um and I think that's where public land hunters they like that that adventure and that was me years and years ago just being able to hunt a new piece all the time. You never. That's the cool part. It's a mystery. You never know what's there. You might kill a giant, but um, just be prepared for a lot of work. I'd get into shape. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Just, pra- I mean, if you have to, just to get ready for season, just practice putting your tree stand up and taking it right back down. Just getting a getting a habit of doing it quietly, because that's half the battle. Is, you know, you, you get you know sneak right into a bedding area, and if you can do it silently. Them deer will not move. I mean, if, if, even if you make them the minor little bit of sound, it, it's just, and if it's just, if it's a scattered, you know, if it's not just all jumbled, it's just constant sound coming from that spot, you know, and that, that's just one thing I, I, I do is I'll sneak into a spot. It might take me an hour to move the last 60 yards, 70 yards, if, if it's that thick. And, but if you get in there and you slip in there with one of those stands and hell, even on the ground, but but yeah, those lone wolves uh, changed the game for me when I started using them. I mean, sure helped. I know the body really liked it, just uh, the, just the less weight. So definitely lone wolf stand and and just yeah, run and gun. I agree there. I uh, a lot of times, I mean, you, that Lucas brings up a good point. There is, you know, you can go in there, you can make quite a bit of noise. Actually, I mean, if you're hunting like you know, a big buck or whatever, who knows if it's going to get up. But I'm saying I've been in a lot of situations where I walked in, like tried to sneak in and it's just louder than hell. And I'm, I'm like, man, this, I'm, this is just a waste of my time. You know, I'm crunching through these cattails and it was windy at my house and now it's like zero miles an hour. And I'm just sitting here like, wow, this is stupid. And I get up in my tree, I start, you know, getting up in my tree and you actually either see deer that night. They just don't, you know, you, they, if you sound like a, a deer just walking around, I don't think they're going to be spooked unless they get your scent. But I've also got up in trees and as soon as I get up in the tree, there's deer r- jumping and moving. And, you know, they saw me once I got up in my tree, I got too high. And I'm like, yep. They didn't even know that I was a deer until they either see you or smell you. They're, I don't yep. think they're going to get off. Yep. Same thing. Same thing. Yep. I've seen that a bunch of times, Curtis. Yep. Yeah. And that's when I learned how, uh, when I get into certain areas, you get into a spot where the, the, the timber is kind of low. It's kind of low. It's not very, uh, it's not big, high timber. And so that's where, you know, you got to stay down a little bit lower. Even if there is a big tree that you can get up high in, you just want to stay right. You want to stay at least below the you know the 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 
the average height of the trees there. Cause you know, once you, that's right. I've, I've done that. I don't know how many times I've climbed up in trees. And once you get to the top, the top four stick and turn around and I'll have a buck just standing up, just eyeballing me at about 60 yards. I mean, it's <laughs> like crap. There he is. You know? So, I mean, yeah, it, it's a fun, you guys are going to have fun. I'm excited for you guys. I don't even, I'm so excited to hear from here, how, how it goes for you guys. It's going to be incredible. It'll be fun. Well, it's, if we if we fall flat on our face, it's your guys' fault. Oh, oh, you guys will most likely. <laughs> yes, most likely will. Not not the rain on your parade, but yeah, it's a, it's a whole other game. I mean, it. But it'll be a lot. Uh, you guys are going to find it be a lot of fun. You know, as long as you guys stay mentally, uh, you know, into it, where you know that it's going to be hard, and and as long as you just keep working at it, you keep trying. And, and laugh at the dumb things that happen. Just be able to laugh because if you can't laugh, you're gonna just you're gonna hate public land hunting. That's just as simple as I can put it. If you can't laugh at yourself every now and then for how hard you've tried just to do what you just did and it failed horribly, then yeah, you might as well just stay home or go back to you know, the private land. Yeah, you definitely have to appreciate the journey for sure. I've definitely yeah, yeah. been in situations where you go out there and you hunt and it's just the one of the worst times ever. And you're just thinking to yourself, you're like, dude, I'm never bow hunting again in my life. And you, you get back, <laughs> you get back to the parking lot, you know, it's a Sunday night, like 1130 PM, you get back to the parking lot. And you're just like, this is the worst hunt I've ever been on in my life. And I'm never going to bow hunt ever again. And then you go through the work week and Friday rolls around. And you're like, Oh man, I can't wait to go bow hunting again. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you guys find, especially maybe Curtis, do you find a GPS is a must? A GPS? Yeah, that's that's one thing I was going to say is, uh, I mean, the lone wolf, yeah, to get back to your question, I guess you kind of got a little off topic, but the lone wolf uh, would be my number one, and the GPS would be probably my number two because, I mean, there's a lot of spots where it's so easy to get turned around, especially when you're trying to navigate at night. I think that's what... I think that's when I was younger, when I just started public land hunting, I had a GPS, but I was still, it was kind of crappy and you you couldn't get like good service, like in the really thick stuff. So I think a lot of people go out and they, they hunt, you know, just kind of areas where they know they're safe almost. And I think if you get a good GPS, it's a total game changer because I'll go anywhere and not, you know, even if, I mean, I'll pretty much go anywhere, wherever I can go, I'll go, you know, if you have a GPS or a phone with an app or something, you know. Todd, anything to add? Um, yeah, like Lucas, I, in, uh, actually at the video school, my whole segment was about running and gunning. And most of what I was talking about was just slowing down. And that's what I've learned over the years is you've really got to get close into these big ones. If you're going to get a crack at them, they just don't move that far, whether you're hunting public land or private land or anything they get to that age for a reason and it's because they're not out cruising the field edges and stuff. So I, I probably typically fail on 90% of my, uh, whitetail encounters. I mean, like if I know where a buck's at or if I'm stalking at a buck bedding area, I mean, I'll plant, I'll fail nine times before I finally get a crack at one. Now, whether I shoot that buck or not, I don't know, but it is imperative you got to get into the their core areas so you have to sometimes be aggressive but then you got to know when to slow down and not make any metal noise and i think that's where the you've really got to have that patience um and that comes from experience so i think the thing you guys are going to do is you're going to go and you're going to learn a lot some of it will be bad and some of it will be good um and if you end up getting a crack at one along the way then that's just a bonus but you've got to yep. um you just then that's the way you got to look at it and so all those years i hunted all the illinois different properties and this that, and there i may not have killed any huge bucks on those properties but the experience that i had that i took away from all that um is worth its weight in gold now and all these different bucks that i've killed in the last several years it's been the experiences of the bucks and then the encounters from all those years that led up to this um and so yeah dude just go have fun and learn and if you get if you kill one you kill one if not uh then uh so be it. Yeah. Yeah. Just like Todd said, you know, go in there, be aggressive. Like that, that's one thing that I, once I started being aggressive and not worrying about bumping the deer and, and, uh, cause if you're hunting public in most places, you got 
thousands and thousands of acres to hunt. So it's not like when you're in private, it, it can almost get boring because you kind of, you know, in some some cases, because you, you don't want to bump that deer so bad because, well, once you bump them and you, you know, screw it all up and then you're, now your private spot's kind of kind of messed up and you just got to hope and pray, you know, something happens in the rut or, you know, late season something's moving in or you just get lucky. And what I like about the public land is you find that you just find a deer. I'll find a track. If I find a track, I don't care. Like, obviously, I, I don't care what's on their head. If I find a big mature deer, that's, that's what I'm going after in that, in that spot. And so if I know he's going into this bedding area, I might set up in a, you know, an observation stand the first night if I don't think that if, you know, if maybe he's not crossing several times. Because a lot of times a deer will go in one spot and go, come in the other or, you know, have several different spots going in and out. So if I find a spot that I'm not too confident that he's going to come down that trail that day or night, I'm just going to, I'm going to sit back where I can see a little bit in that area the first time. And then if I see him, then I'm going to move in on him, depending on what time of the year that is. But, but for the most part, yeah, just get in there, kind of take your time moving in on a deer. And then once he's there, just try to capitalize right then and now, because Tomorrow, Rico, Rico and his dog could come tromping through there, <laughs> so, so you just never know. <laughs> that's that's, yeah. uh, that's, that's uh, something I actually wrote down when I was listening to Psycho's podcast. Is um, I, that's why I think that's one downfall for me. It's one of my. I feel like I know if there's a buck coming out, or or you know, if I have this feeling that there's a buck in this area, I go in there and just get after it like super aggressive and i think that's kind of where i screw myself up sometimes because you can you can be aggressive but you can be super aggressive and yep yep you know like i think i like the. i'm going to try this a little more often here in wisconsin this year after listening to that is you know kind of sit back and figure it out which i mean i i know there's a little, it's a lot more open in North Dakota. I'm guessing you can see a longer ways like Wisconsin. There's a lot of areas where it's like, dude, you can't, there's no way you can glass or, you know, where you could probably put yeah. trail cam, you could probably put trail cameras like farther away where you think they're going to go and kind of use that as your glassing, you know? But a lot of times I'll just like, dude, I just go in there and it's, it's, I think sometimes I kind of shoot myself in the foot especially this year, I kind of, this last early season, I really, I mean, I was super aggressive one in and, and hunted these bedding areas where I was just like right on top of them where I think if I would have, I think I would have been more successful if I would have kind of sat back a little bit. But I mean, I guess it all plays into how much time you have too. Like, like Lucas mm-hmm. said, and, I mean, if you don't have a lot of time to do it, you got to just get, try to get it done, you know? I mean, once I'm in an area and I'm, I, once I hunt this, like a bedding area or something, I'm like, it's junk. I feel like it's junk. And because I went in there and I got my scent everywhere and I feel like, yeah, I'm definitely going to try something else. So, mm-hmm. I mean, this is a good point that Lucas brought up, I guess, is the, the try to, you know, glass, but, you know, stay aggressive at the same time, but don't get too aggressive. <laughs> But yeah, well, it might be it might be something where there, there's several trails that kind of move off from one spot, or or there's several trails you know moving through, and, and maybe an open piece of timber or a, or a little creek bottom or something like that, where you you know you, instead of going in on that trail that looks like the big buck is using, you know, say you're going to go in there like you think this is the bu- this is the trail he's using, and I better just walk in on this trail and you know and kind of get in where this trail's going and get closer to him. So I guess in my, you know, if I can, if I feel like, it's all a feel thing too. I mean, one day I might set up in an area where there's just a few trails where, you know, I, I can, you know, I'd shoot out to about 40, 50 yards. So you can cover that, you know, 90, 80, 90, 100 yard gap, right? If, if, that's, if it's open enough. But that's where, you know, that's where I would say if you can sit back just a little bit the first time, I, I'm, I'm probably going to do that more times than most. But it's all a feel thing too. It's all the property. It's all the history of the you know where you're where you're at, and and that is just how you feel that you know that whole week if you've had a horrible time hunting and finally you're just like, oh cow, there's a there's a big deer here. There's a big deer here. You get all excited and you just you just go in there and get after it. And you know sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But you know at the end of the day, 
you just go, all right, I got thousands of more acres out there to, to get after it. So whatever I'm going on and you can always come back to it. You know, it doesn't mean you just killed it just cause you went in there once or twice, you know, and I, I'll cycle back to spots all year long, all year long. I'll just cycle back through them, you know, hunt them a little right. bit. And then, you know, a month later I might come back. I like, I think I like the, the point that Todd brought up too in his podcast is he talked a lot about, um, you know, kind of hunting the downwind areas where other people are hunting or where other deer are traveling. And that kind of, that kind of played in. I started thinking about it. And I mean, I've just for an example on my Missouri hunt, I, I went in and, and there was a big giant trail coming across this creek crossing. And I went in running gun and kind of kept, I, I was on the uh, downwind side of the, the trail, so I didn't, you know, if anything was coming down the trail, I could shoot at it and without it winding me. And it was just a big, giant trail. But then there was a little thicker area just, you know, downwind of that where I'm like, all right, there's probably going to be a good deer coming out there. But there's another trail, but it was a smaller, fainter trail. And that's what Todd was talking about. And for some reason, my gut was all like, oh, dude, I should go sit over there. But I ended up sitting over the big giant trail with all the tracks. And <laughs> then I ended up seeing a really nice buck, actually three of them, but one really good one, come right down that trail, right through the thick stuff, downwind of that other trail, and then ended up kind of buggering out. But I was like, after thinking about that, you know, it's like, but then, yep. you know, that, that's what got brought up is when uh the uh getting too aggressive too you know if you you know if you sit back and watch you might screw yourself too where i could have just been like yep. All right, i'm going right down on that trail and hunting that buck that night and you know shooting them so i mean it's, there's so many yeah. factors and variables and all that but there's a lot to talk about i i think right, half, half of the battle is just finding them a- <laughs> Yeah, half of the half of the battles just find a mature deer that you want to kill, and then what I've realized here, and just through hunting, having history with these different deer, is when you we're all trying to kill like the dominant buck in these areas. When they when they've put the time and energy into establishing their dominance in those areas, it's going to take a hell of a lot to run them out, especially during the rut. I mean, you can run them out, but I can't believe how much pressure you can put on if you do it right. And and at, that's where access comes in for me. I'm able to come in from all different directions that most of these guys aren't but i consider bumping a deer a good piece of intel now i know where he was at right then and i know he's probably going to be in the same area tomorrow and now i just have to figure out all right generally downwind of where i had the encounter with him or blew it like it's sometimes the best thing you can do is just keep the freaking gas pedal on and just hammer and hammer and hammer and you're going to crack them because they have the same thing going on they have a limited time to breed instinctually their bodies are telling them they have to breathe, they have to breathe, they have to breathe. They're not just going to go live by themselves you know, during the rut because somebody's hunting them. Um, but I'll, I'll end with that and then also just mention one other thing. I usually get more aggressive during the season. I try to go a little bit easy in late rut because I want to leave those bucks alone to a certain degree because they're going to stay in their core area. Um, but then as it gets to the middle of the rut, toward the end of, toward the end of most guys hunting seasons is when you can catch big deer on some of these pieces of public because these bucks have lived in their er- in those areas their whole life they know when the when the humans are there when the pressure's on and it's generally going to be the first week of november second week of november um and also in october most guys the vacation runs out and by about like the 15th of november around here most guys I have done are already tagged out they've shot something or whatever and that's when i really start getting into my hunting because it, at least for big mature deer around my neck of the woods, that's when they start getting vulnerable. And I, I, I think it's just, it's that time of year. They're not going to, they're not going to be sticking so closely in their core areas. They're frustrated because they're starting to run out of does to breed and they've gotten a little taste of the love. Um, and I, it, it just creates a vulnerability in them. So, you know, the best thing you guys might plan on doing is avoiding, you know, the early November hunting on public land and go toward later, uh, or maybe mid, mid to late October and avoid the rush because I think the bucks do the same thing, but you can catch those same bucks on those pieces of public later on when they know the coast is clear, so to speak. I, I agree there. Like for the most part, the only thing that I would have to say about that is I saw some of the bigger bucks 
you know, that November 15th range. But you also have to keep in consideration there's a lot, a lot of gun hunters in Wisconsin, and that's the weekend before gun hunting. And uh, there's, like, yeah. everyone walking around trying to find gun stands and spots. So I've come across that where that late, that weekend before gun hunting, it's good if you can find a spot where there's not people walking around all over the place, you know. But I agree yeah, with that 100%. We're... Oh, we're so, dude, we're lucky here in Iowa. We Our bow season runs all the way until, I think, like, I think it's the end of November, but like that last period of November where in Michigan, uh, gun season starts on November 15th as well. Uh, so, I mean, literally in our brains, we were programmed as Michiganders where on November 15th, everything's over for the year. You know, you're pretty much done and then your next chance is going to be the following season. But, um, here in Iowa, we have the seasons right, thankfully. So that late November hunting is spectacular for bow hunters just because the deer, they just move more. Lucas, any, any, Closing remarks, final thoughts, marching yeah. orders. Yes, yeah. go. So one thing that I know we haven't covered, I guess, is, is like now when you're going around scouting this summer, and then this just reminded me because the other day uh, my, my, my dad drove by and seen all these bucks in the particular area right down by my house here. And it just reminded me that the, the seasonal changes of those deer are, are, are pretty tricky. You know, if you see a deer early season in the velvet in an area, don't count on that deer just being there all year. Because cause, uh, there's, there's, at least up in North Dakota, these deer, are, are, it seems like they move around a lot, especially with the river moving up. And uh, they get kind of pushed up out of the low spots and uh, with the flooding. So you'll see deer in particular spots that you're going to go, all right, I know where he's at. He's going to go kill that deer. And, uh, you know, you'll come hunting season. You'll never see that deer. You'll never get a picture of him or anything. So, uh just, just don't ever bank on, on just all velvet scouting, all trail camera scouting, you know. Just really just getting getting out there, putting your boots on the ground, and uh, and, and and figuring it out. And then uh, don't ever just bank on one area. Just keep moving, keep bouncing, keep trying stuff. Try stupid stuff, Cause, you know. And, and stupid stuff, I mean, is if if you're walking into it and you're thinking it's stupid, well, just do it anyways. And and and. That can be sometimes one of the best hunting is going in and sitting in an area that, well, I never see anybody over there, and and you think in your head that, well, it's because it's not not really a particular spot that anybody really hunt, and I wouldn't even hunt that spot. But and man, this particular times of the year, you can just find deer in just weird spots, and uh, just keep after it, man. Just keep after it, and and uh, don't don't settle down. Just keep looking for public land spots. And go and hit them. Curtis? 100% agree with Psycho there. I feel like a lot of times you get set up and you're like, wow, this is, good. This is such a great spot. I got perfect access, everything, and you don't see anything. And then it's always just the stupid situations. All of a sudden, you're seeing deer. Um, so I guess other than that, uh, since this is getting kind of lengthy, I just want to say that I got mad respect for all you guys. Um, Todd and Psycho, for sure. I've looked up to both of you guys for the longest time. I still do. And I'm just kind of humbling for me. That I'm sitting here talking on the phone with you guys, you know, and uh, appreciate the inspiration, motivation, and everything I've learned from from you guys. So, to, hey man, right back, right back at you. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate yeah. that, Curtis. Oh, go Absolutely. ahead, Todd. Absolutely, bud. No, and I, we're proud of you, and happy that you're able to pursue your own dream doing um, uh, beyond the bow, behind the bow. And I think the cool part, I think, in all of us, we all have a, a unique personality, but also kind of a wildness where you know we don't want to be traditional, we don't want to be conventional. We're going to do our own thing, and I think that's a quality that you really have to have. If you want to be a good hunter, you can't, there's no cookie cutter approach you can just use and become successful. You have to figure out a way to adapt to those situations and everybody does something a little different. So, uh, I look forward to seeing, uh, what are the season brings for all of us. And I appreciate both of you guys getting involved in these conversations because I always learn something. Uh, it never ceases to amaze me just getting another perception, another perspective, especially from a different part of the country. Uh, and you can find some similarities and differences in your own world and make it your own, man. You guys said it, you know, just like Curtis said, you know, I 
respect both of you guys like crazy. And when uh, Jason asked me to be a part of this, I mean, it was there was no I didn't think about it twice, man. It was like, hell yeah, I'm gonna talk deer with these guys. And uh, and Curtis, man, you know, you know, I appreciate the love, but man, you're doing it, you're doing it. And I just told my wife the other day when when you released that, you know, your trailer there, I said, man, this kid. This kid, I love this kid, man, and and I, and he just, you, I told her like he's motivating me, so you're doing it right back for me, buddy. You know, so I appreciate that, and and I like you know, like Todd, I can always watch Todd and get all pumped up about deer hunting, that's for sure. So you know, and Todd, <laughs> no, Todd, Todd gave me a yeah, Todd Todd got, gave me a shot at at uh, you know filming and, and sharing my stories, and I freaking you know I'll always be thankful for that stuff, and you know, I'm, like I said, I'm just I'm just pumped about it all, man. I'm I'm pumped for those, you know. Jason and uh, and Dave to get out there public land hunting, and uh, I'm, I'm excited to see what happens for all of us this season. It'll be fun to share share our stories. We'll have to get back together somehow and and uh, chat about it. Well, I think we can definitely plan on some sort of follow up episode, maybe when uh, when it's uh, white outside and much cooler than it is right now. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's been it's been a ton of fun uh, to do these, and and selfishly, I think for David and myself, um, it's been um eye opening uh i know that it's going to be a lot of work um and i i suppose somewhere deep down part of my motivation for coming up with this idea was so that i could learn a little bit more um and i've I've heard you guys say it again and again and there's just no substitute for putting your boots on the ground and getting out there and doing it and uh i've already uh i've i've done you know quite a few miles already and there's many 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 miles to go but the um the lesson that i've learned at least through this process is that uh there's no substitute for just getting out there and doing it there's there's no computer that's going to get this job done for you there's no um motivational cd there, there's, there's 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 nothing that is going to uh, replace actual experience and and that's uh what i've heard you guys say over and over again and i, I can't think of uh three better guys to learn from than you guys so it's been a a a pleasure on my part and and uh i'll i'll turn it over to dave here for a second and then uh we'll say our goodbyes and and uh end it with that how's that sound right on cool cool yeah i just want to thank you guys it's been a pleasure to be a part of this i took a ton of notes uh i thoroughly enjoy all three of you guys but it i i learn a ton and just want to say thank you oh thank you no problem no problem Thank you, Jason, for putting this together and uh, for you, the listeners, and hopefully you, you pick something up on our White Knuckle podcast. Uh, uh, between all three of us, we've covered a lot of different territories and a lot of different places in the U.S., and we certainly don't know it all. But uh, with you, we're learning at the same time. So it's always fun to talk right. with other whitetail guys and uh, just wish you guys the best season. Be safe out there this summer. Get your work done. And uh, remember, most of your big bucks get killed in the summertime. <laughs> <laughs> real real quickly uh lucas what what can we expect from you in the future well um, i know you don't i don't i know you don't have any definitive plans where you can um point anybody um but we're mm-hmm. where where are we going to see lucas's mug next besides well, just, the post you know, office it's gonna be, yep it's gonna be just something <laughs> something very similar to what what curtis is doing just gonna be probably not quite as in-depth as curtis is he's He's man. He's he's really kicking it, kicking ass with the uh, the old the old editing system there, and and uh, I'm probably not going to be as in depth as that, but uh, I'm going to share my stories. I'm going to do my own thing and just uh, and, you know maybe do a YouTube channel and put up a site and you know and and uh, try to share my stories in my own words and just you know just do it. You know only only for the fact that I love to do it and I love I love to share the stories with people and I love I love talking with people about hunting. I mean. I could sit here all night and talk with you guys, and I'm pretty sure everybody else would too. But you know, time time is time is valuable these days, boys. So, uh, well, you know, I just want to thank everybody. Thank everybody for sharing. You know, I, I learn something every time we talk, and so you know, just want you guys to take care, and you know, best of luck to you guys. Yeah. Well, when it comes time, um, we will absolutely make sure that our listeners uh, know what it is that you're doing, Curtis. Um, yeah. Tell us the truth. Did you really edit that trailer? Edit it, dude, man. I I was actually working on that thing for uh, three months, and I was talking to my buddy Skyler. We were, he's a co-owner, and um, he's like, dude, he's getting on my case. He's like, dude, you need to get this thing edited. You need to get this thing edited. I'm like, 
man, I got to wait for, you know, I have to get some shots when it's raining out at night and it takes time. I'm working nights and it's just, I don't know. I mean, when it, when not, it's not just the hunting footage, but when you get into like the, try to get into the more film cinematography stuff, which uh, there's so much stuff to learn. It's like, uh, it's mind blowing how, how much time just one shot takes, you know, and it's just a matter of if you want to do it or not, you know? Um, well, you I nailed do, it. That was awesome. Uh, thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Um, I just wanted to say one last thing Two, actually two things quick. Um, Happy Father's Day to, I know Psycho, you got three of them, and Dave, I think you got a couple, and Jason, I know you got, Todd, I don't know, you got one on the way, or what's the deal? I have a cat, <laughs> its name's Kiki. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I wanted to say Happy Father's Day to you guys, because, I mean, uh, that I was just actually talking to Lucas earlier about this, is like, Man, that adds a whole new thing too, especially if they're younger. Like Psycho, you got a couple younger ones, and I mean, if you're going out and hunting public land and getting it done, and on top of that, you have kids and a family and all that, man, that's that's some that's some hardcore stuff right there. I can't, I can't yeah, you know, you know, I can't just even to touch hold a girlfriend. That. <laughs> you know, just to touch on that quick, that was that was like a lot of the motivational factor of uh, just just breaking away from from, from White Knuckle and Todd and everybody was because I just my time was just being swallowed up so much that I just didn't want to not be able to go a hundred percent and give White Knuckle a hundred percent like I like I always have. I've always been a hundred percent guy, so I knew it with work. I you know I got got you know promoted at work and there's more more responsibilities. You know the kids, and you know I'm just I'm becoming more of just the family, you know, family, you know, dad. I like being dad, so so it's just like now if I could just do it on my own, I can just find the time and and release everything on my own terms and when I do it and how I do it, and that's really all it was. There was, I mean, freaking, there was no no loss between all of us, you know. And went down and talked to Todd all about it at his house, had some beers in the creek, and that was a good time. We got to do that again, Todd. Oh, amen. And uh, I'm... yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So. So yeah, that's it, man. That's 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 what's going on in my neck of the woods, guys. Well, ha- um, happy Father's Day to everybody out there, and um, I think it's time for us to uh, say good night yep. and God bless. All right, peace, brother. Love you, love you guys. Well, the Love Fest is over. Thanks for listening. I hope you all enjoyed that as much as I did doing it. Uh, It's been a long show. Uh, Thanks for listening. And uh, again, just want to remind you to do those things that uh, I had asked earlier in the show regarding being included in the drawing for the Ozonics prize package. All right. I think that's about it. With that, we'll close out the show for today. Thanks for listening. Make it a great day. Jason out.